Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, M2 Embark presentations for 2018. Uh, please take your seats. I'd like to remind you there are refreshments in the ante room. I'd like to begin by asking Dean Fulberg to say a few opening remarks. Dean Fulberg. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back. And welcome to Beaumont Royal Oak. We'll be spending like the next two years mostly, in addition to other places in Beaumont. It's really exciting, and I have to say that usually when they want me to start a program, it's to say something inspiring. The most inspiring thing is to see your class back here after the step break. That's really the most inspiring thing. Many of you have already taken STEP, and so congratulations for having that in your rearview mirror. Uh, for those who still have to take it, be inspired by the fact that other people survived it, and they're here today, right? Just a rough show of hands, because the faculty, Department of Biomedical Sciences, which uh, we may have an announcement about uh, later today or first thing tomorrow morning, something interesting happening to that wonderful department. Um, but they give you these gifts of these t-shirts. About how many people actually wore it to take STEP, who took STEP? Yeah, okay, good. Hopefully that, that gave you a good vibe and, and psyched other people who were in the room. So let me start off, yeah, let me start off by uh, congratulating the class for a really fabulous attendance. I have been at events like this where the only people who come to a presentation where there's a competition are the people who are competing. I was actually here at Beaumont Royal Oak for something dealing with residents only about a week or so ago. And at this time of the morning, there were only six or seven people in the room. And the fact that we're here um, to listen to these presentations and for have you support the folks who are giving their presentations is really awesome. And it really speaks to the OUWB community. Most of you were not here for commencement. Um, that's okay, we understand you were studying in a way. Um, we have an alumni speaker this year, uh, Dr. Kimberly Waite, who graduated two years ago and she gave the alumni address. I had no idea till Kim spoke that there was a hashtag called OUWBFAM, OUWB FAM. And um, I know now, I won't abuse it. <laughs> but I do want to tell you that having all of you to support the people who will be giving their presentations today is a manifestation of OUWBFAM. So thank you, congratulations to those who are presenting. And congratulations to all of you because all of you are engaged in Embark and do you know the next time that you'll all be together talking about what you did in Embark? The next time is the night before your match day. Just to let you in, I go, oh, I heard that, right? And what happens is you will get together and each one of you will have a poster to present. Some of you will have platform presentations to give. And the wonderful thing is, although you'll be together for M3, you think you're in track, so it's really a trauma. The first time we had a class go into M3 in our very first class was, well, we can't do the whole thing all to one class together on internal medicine. So it was traumatic to split you up. The real trauma comes at the beginning of M4 where you're just totally scattered. So the next time you do this will be the first time you'll see your class together in one spot at one time the night before match day. So you have lots of really wonderful things to look forward to. And before I hand the microphone back over to Dr. Loftus for the program, I want to give a special thanks to the Oakland University Federal Credit Union uh, for sponsoring uh, the awards that will be given today to three of the presenters. Uh, they're all really wonderful presentations. All of your research is wonderful. How we select the best is something that I would never want to be engaged in. But the Federal Credit Union does give out some prizes. Remember also that you do qualify, not just the people who are dressed up like it's interview day today, um, but you all do qualify for uh, Embark-related scholarships. Uh, Rick Kelly is here in the room and he can help you during a break or during a reception talk to you about it. I see some puzzled faces in here. So what does this mean? It means that you can apply for scholarships based upon the topic that you picked, whether it has high scientific or high social impact, 
and the progress that you've made. And if you are selected, then you receive scholarship support for M4 as a reward for doing something really awesome and doing it awesomely well. So this is not the end of, of your ability to benefit from outstanding performances in Embark. My day job calls for me to be somewhere else for these presentations, so I do apologize to the presenters. And I wish you all abundant success today and going forward in the M3. We'll talk again before you start M3. I just can't wait to see you in the tunnels in the middle of the winter and ask you how your day is going. Okay. okay. <coughs> uh, thank you, Dean Felberg. Um, Again, I'd like to uh, echo what Dean Felberg said. The standard of the oral presentations is really very high, and it improves year on year, so we're very pleased with that. I'd like to remind the students that you are required to give constructive feedback to the presenters online. Um, we will not be announcing the winners today. It takes too long to collect the, collect the scores. Uh, the abstract booklet is now available on, online, so all your abstracts can be uh, in that booklet. Again, I'd like to thank the Oakland University Credit Union for sponsoring this event. Uh, now, the details. Each presenter has nine minutes total, so that's uh, five minutes to present, and then there's four minutes for questions and answers and to, for a handover. Yes? Can we raise the volume a little bit? Oh. Uh, can we raise the volume, David? <laughs> I'll, okay, I'll, I'll use my theatre voice there. How's, how's that? <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my God, even I can hear me. <laughs> so nine minutes, per, nine minutes per presenter. So five minutes to present four minutes for questions and answers. So please do have a couple of questions for each presenter. Now for the presenters. Uh, the most important person in the room for you today here is Julie Strong. She's your timekeeper. So when you've got two minutes to go, she will hold up this sign. And when your time's up, she'll hold up this sign. You do not have to stop dead if you see this sign, but uh, you do have to start winding up. and Give yourself about 10 or 15 seconds. If I have to come up and stand beside you, that means you really must stop, okay? All right. Um, okay, we'll start with our first uh, presenter. Okay, thank you. Uh, our first presenter is Neha Ansari. Please welcome Neha. October 5th, 2017, the New York Times breaks a story about Harvey Weinstein and his decades of sexual abuse. October 17th, 2017, the Me Too movement begins via this tweet. December 18th, 2017, Time Magazine names the Silence Breakers as their 2017 Person of the Year. January 25th, 2018, the Detroit Free Press publishes this front page with the names of all the women who came forward about Larry Nassar's years of sexual abuse. Hi everyone, my name is Nehan Sari, and I'm here to talk to you today about my Embark project on reporting sexual assault. This project is done under the supervision of Dr. Purdy and Dr. Pickett from the OU Department of Psychology. As many of you know, sexual assault is extremely prominent in today's world, with statistics showing that every 98 seconds, someone in the United States is sexually assaulted. Furthermore, studies have shown that sexual assault is one of the most underreported crimes. As we can see in this infograph, almost all perpetrators will walk free. Additionally, there's little research on what type of women are more or less likely to report these crimes. This leads us to my research question, in which I ask, what type of woman based on her demographics, is likely to report sexual assault. This research question is important because constructing a profile of a woman that is likely to report sexual assault can be used to devise tools for combating barriers that prevent women from initially reporting these crimes. Additionally, constructing a profile can provide insight on which group, in which groups of women are more in need of public health and education efforts. We also care because studies have shown that when victims see other victims reporting these crimes and attaining justice, they too become empowered to report these crimes. This leads us to our existing work. Although existing work in this field of research is fairly sparse, the most recent and most relevant work is related to the 2016 Department of Justice Criminal Victimization Report, which showed two interesting facts. One, it showed that 
household income was not a major discrepancy between the groups that did or did not report sexual assault, and two, that this crime is much more likely to be reported by white people compared to Hispanic and black people. This leads us to our approach in which we use an online survey that asks participants to place themselves in the shoes of a victim of sexual assault. The, uh, the participant then responds to questions based off of what she would do in the scenario, what her perception of the barriers towards reporting are, and we also ask each participant demographic questions such as her age, her race, her household income, her education level, and those type of things. Our survey population is Oakland University female psychology students as well as community women. And we're currently in the phase of survey distribution of this project. Anticipated outcomes are based off of the 2016 criminal victimization report. Thus, we hypothesize that minority women will show decreased willingness to report sexual assault. We're also interested to see how religion, age, and household income will affect participants' willingness to report. Our anticipated challenges include the number of responses as it is with any survey-based study. We're also um, concerned about ob obtaining enough diversity in our participant population. As you can see in these pie charts, the Oakland University ethnic breakdown does differ from the overall United States. Therefore, we hope to get enough minorities to participate in our study. Additionally, since our study uses a hypothetical scenario, we hope that participants are as, as authentic and as genuine as possible when responding. Although this factor is a bit difficult to control in this pilot study, we have multiple reminders throughout the survey to ask participants to be as honest as possible when answering our questions. And in conclusion, uh, this is a fairly new area of research. It's something I'm very passionate about and excited to be working on. I feel like uh, especially lucky to have started this project before the whole Me Too movement started. So I feel very fortunate for that. And the results of this project can be used to increase reporting of sexual assault so that the women and men can attain the justice that they deserve. Future work would involve um, studying how the demographic factors would affect willingness to report. And we'd also be interested in looking at how the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim may affect willingness to report. These are my references and I know five minutes isn't a lot so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have and thank you for your time. Uh, I have a, ro a roaming mic. Any questions please? Very nice job, uh, Neha. Good work. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, what's your plan for if you don't have enough people from the given minority groups um, participating in the study? Uh huh. Um, for. I think we would just continue survey collection. Um, right now we're hoping to get, let's go back, um, 200 female psychology students and 200 community women. If we weren't getting enough minorities, we would probably put up more flyers in the community in more minority-based um, communities and where the more minorities live and reside, so that type of thing. In regards to the female psychology students, um, we would just continue collecting data, hoping that we get enough minorities to participate. Excellent job, thanks. Uh, just a question, uh, when you were doing your literature review, did you see any material out there that uh, brought in job rank? Mm -hmm. So after the Me Too movement, a lot of discussion continuing on uh, social media about the female's position in their job and the male's position in their job and vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you not include job in the survey? Or, and if you didn't, is there anything out there regarding literature that explains sort of that kind of quiet demographic that goes on. Yeah. Um, actually, there wasn't any literature on that specific topic. And we didn't think of it, to be really honest, when we were starting the study. And that's why I mentioned it in my future work. That would definitely be a future direction that we'd like to look at. Time for one more question. Thanks, Neha. That was awesome. Um, I'm wondering, since you mentioned that you had started this before the Me Too movement and you're still in the survey distribution phase, mm -hmm. have you considered how the Me Too movement might impact the responses that you're getting in your surveys and what you're doing to address that? Yeah, I think that's definitely going to affect it, especially because we just started survey distribution maybe like a month and a half ago. 
So I think that's definitely going to be a big factor. I don't really know how to combat it, but we're just definitely going to take that into account when we look at the data and think like, oh, maybe this would have been different if we started distributing our surveys maybe a year ago. I think one thing that would be interesting to do is maybe repeat the study like five years from now and see how things would differ then. Can I speak into it? Yes. Okay. It's it, it fixed up quite well. All right. Uh, our next presenter is Kojo Asante. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Kojo Asante, and today I'd like to talk to you about the effect of spatial ability on the retention rate of minimally invasive robotic surgical skills. So today, residencies require that their students achieve technical benchmarks set by the ACGME. Now with an increasing number of minimally evasive procedures being done across the country, these benchmarks now have specific guidelines for both robotic and laparoscopic procedures. Now these procedures require that a surgeon views their tools via a screen, so studies have shown that spatial ability is an increasing, increasingly important factor to the acquisitioning of these skills. So we've des uh, defined spatial ability as the complex and multi-step manipulation of 3D information. Studies have already shown that those with higher spatial ability have an advantage when it comes to accuracy and the efficiency of movement of their tools. Thus, this allows them to reach those proficiency benchmarks at a faster rate. However, there have been very few studies to show whether or not they are able to retain those uh, skills over the course of a four to six year residency and beyond. As the old adage goes, if you don't use it, you lose it. The studies already suggest that those with lower spatial ability will need greater amounts of time to actually attain those skills. So one must ask, will they also forget those skills at a faster rate with prolonged periods without practice? So the goal of our study is to ultimately determine whether those with high spatial ability will show greater retention rates than those with lower spatial ability. So to achieve this goal, we've designed a two-phase study. The first stage will include M3 and M4 medical students, along with PGY1 through PGY6 surgical residents. They will be tasked with completing the mental rotations test, which will determine whether or not they are of high or low spatial ability. Next, they will complete the ring walk task on the MIMIC simulator. They will complete this ta uh, task to proficiency, which has already been preset by the simulator, looking at specific factors such as time to completion, the number of drops, the number of uh, tool collisions, and the efficiency of movement. Next, all those who actually attain proficiency will move on to phase two, which is the retention phase. This will include retestings at intervals of one, three, and six months, and the retesting will again assess whether they are able to attain proficiency within the ring walk task. The scores will then be analyzed to determine a rate of skill retention, and these scores will then uh, have the proper parametric or non-parametric statistical analysis applied to it. So we do anticipate to see a positive correlation between an individual's uh, spatial, indiv uh, spatial ability and the rate of retention over time. So currently, we are in the acquisi acquisition phase of the study, and we hope to begin the retention phase uh, beginning in July or early August. And some challenges with this study so far has been uh, that there's some discrepancy within the literature as to how long must be allowed before you actually see a decline to, uh, beyond that original proficiency that they would have attained uh, through phase one. However, there have been a number of studies uh, which are in agreement with our six-month timeline, so we do hope to see uh, proper regression at that time. Also, scheduling access to the Mimic DV trainer can be difficult as there is only one trainer available at the SLC Center here. Um, however, and also the sessions to actually acquire proficiency can take up to two hours for some students. However, we do hope that scheduling on weekends will allow us sufficient time to actually attain proficiency with a, uh, a number of students. So why is any of this really important? Well, over the course of a long career, surgeons may encounter unique cases where they will be called upon to use uh, skills they may not have practiced over the years. In order to optimize the curriculum for all aspiring surgeons, there may be the need for prolonged education, especially for those with lower spatial ability when it comes to the development of minimally invasive surgical skills. 
If our study does show significant differences between the retention rates of high and low spatial abil ability individuals, this quantitative data, coupled with the uh, already known effect that this has on the acquisitioning of these skills, will not only highlight the importance of the development of spatial ability at the residency level, but also help to identify the development of a long-term model that will help to have more uh, exposure to these uh, procedures and hopefully uh, lead to better outcomes in the operating room. Uh, these are my references, and I would like to thank Dr. Roach uh, for all her guidance with this project, uh, the Applebaum Simula uh, Simulation Learning Institute for the use of their facilities, and for everyone who helped with this project. Thank you very much. Comments, questions? How do you... Um is there a way for you to control or at least measure how long some of these residents or students are pra like practicing their skills outside of mm -hmm. your study as well? Mm -hmm. Or what kind of surgeries they're in and things like that? Because I would think there would be a higher, you know, or, or less regression with people that are in mimic surgeries more often. Mm -hmm. or is, is there any way to control for that or at least measure it? So in terms of measuring that, we will, before every time they do a retesting, have a survey where they uh, do indicate how many times they have either been a part of a minimally evasive surgery, practice on the Da Vinci, uh, on the Mimic machine, uh, or if they've really just been able to have some kind of exposure to it. Um, as M3 and M4 students, there won't ha they won't have as much opportunity to really have that, so we'll definitely be looking at that data very closely. With the residents, it can be very varied, so we'll have to definitely take that into account. A very nice presentation. Thank uh, you. I have a question. Uh, say I'm really lousy at spatial uh, uh, reasoning and, and uh, skill. Uh, what sort of uh, continuing education uh, is done now, and what sort uh, do you think sh should be something that might be an improvement on current? spatial training so with spatial uh, with spatial training most of us do have an innate ability but it is something that can be developed with practice so a lot of right now there are a lot of box trainers being developed um, with, uh, with different uh, technologies there's the computer ones there's um, uh, different tasks that can be used to uh, practice specific uh, specific uh, kind of range of movement so um, whether it's uh, difficulty with visualizing the 2D screen and kind of interpolating that into a 3D, which um, the Mimic does a good job of simulating a 3D experience. So with these newer technologies, it is easier to practice uh, these sort of things, whereas the older technologies were definitely more a 2D thing. So again, there are different technologies out there to help with uh, the development of these skills. But it is mostly just practice. Yep, last question. Um, so women tend to have worse spatial reasoning skills than men. So I'm wondering, are you going to be separating men and women to compare um, their scores so you don't have any outliers? Um, I think uh, initially we're going to keep everyone in the same pool, but that might be something that we look at to see whether or not there is a difference uh, between uh, women and men and to see whether or not um, that actually becomes uh, almost a, maybe a confounding factor, something that we'll have to look into for a future study to uh, determine whether or not we have to target that specifically. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next presenter uh, is Lisa Carver. Please welcome Lisa. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Carver, and I will be discussing my research looking at the readmissions after orthopedic foot and ankle procedures at Beaumont under the guidance of my mentor, Dr. Aaron Baker. The cost of health care in the United States is a particular concern recently, especially with the uncertainty of the Affordable Care Act, as well as other fast other facets of the health system. The U.S. currently spends about $8,000 per capita annually for health care. This is double that of other developed countries, and one reason for this is due to readmissions. 
The average cost of readmissions in the United States across specialties and procedures is about $11,000, leading to significant costs on the system. However, many of these readmissions have been deemed preventable. And preventing these readmissions can significantly improve patient experience as well as improve cost savings for hospitals and other facilities. Prior studies have been done looking at reasons for readmissions in orthopedics. There have been many, many studies done for knees and hips and looking at those procedures, but there have been few looking directly at foot and ankle spe procedures specifically. Of those that have been done, there have been noted to be higher readmission rates for those with diabetes, advanced age, as well as those with certain procedures. Therefore, some of the issues with these studies is that there are very large populations that focus either on one specific procedure or one specific factor. Therefore, there's room for a multivariable study that would look at procedures and factors, as well as a study that accounts for a specific location and hospital type, such as the unique population of Beaumont. And this led to my research question, are there specific factors related to patient visits and admissions to the emergency center after surgical procedures of the foot and ankle by the orthopedic foot and ankle service of Beaumont, with the primary aim to identify these causal factors? and therefore prevent readmissions in the future, and a secondary aim to propose methods to reduce these future admissions. So the data was collected in the past as Beaumont has a continuing improvement and internal review for their surgical procedures, and so this data had already been collected. Of the, the data, there was 6,054 patients between 2012 and 2016, consisting of about 300 inpatient readmissions. Our inclusion criteria consisted of those between the ages of 10 and 95, those that were in fact foot and ankle procedures during this time frame. Our exclusion criteria were those outside of this age range, outside the time frame, those that were trauma procedures, or those that had incomplete records. This project began by first summarizing the procedure codes, as there were numerous codes that needed to be reviewed, and to determine whether those codes directly related to foot and ankle procedures. After reviewing the codes, they were determined whether to be excluded, flagged for further review, or to be included in this study. Th those that were flagged, were the, those charts were flagged, and we needed to go back and do chart reviews for those specific patients. After all those chart reviews had been completed and determined whether or not to be included within this study, a final document containing all patient variables was compiled. And on this final document, a statistical analysis and correlations will be performed. So I have just finished the chart reviews and now I will be performing statistical analysis and correlations next on this data set that I have completed. So again, the next steps are to continue the statistical analysis, looking at correlations, t-tests, and ANOVA potentially, and I may get assistance from the statisticians either at Beaumont or at OUWB. Additionally, my mentor and I have looked at grouping specific procedure codes for further analysis, as multiple codes can indicate similar conditions such as infection. These are some of the variables that we are looking at and considering right now and we anticipate there will be multiple factors identified that would lead to readmissions. Some challenges are that chart reviews take a good amount of time to complete and procedure codes can often be ambiguous, requiring detailed chart reviews to determine whether or not they're related to the procedures that we're looking at. Some solutions to this would be to plan in advance and make sure that we can utilize as many resources as possible at Beaumont. Some limitations that it's only four years of data collection, so we may not see certain uh, factors show up with this short amount of data. And it's also a small adult population from two hospitals, Beaumont, Royal Oak, and Troy. It does not include all of the hospitals currently within the Beaumont Health System. In conclusion, with this research, we hope to identify certain factors that are leading to foot and ankle readmissions and potentially change methods to reduce these readmissions in the future, improving patient experience and reducing costs for the hospital. Future projects could look at additional patient populations, such as pediatrics specifically, or other surgical procedures, and expand beyond the procedure years noted within this research. And these are my references, and I'd like to acknowledge these individuals for assisting me with this project, as well as the Orthopedic Research Institute at Beaumont. And I thank you, and I will take any questions that you have. Thank you. <laughs> Comments, questions? Thanks, Lisa. Great job. Um, I have a question about something you brought up in your lit review. You mentioned that few studies currently have looked at foot and ankle procedures. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why aren't people focusing on that as much? So my mentor and I both looked at that, and we're not certain why that specifically that has not been looked at. There are fewer foot and ankle procedures performed relative to total knee replacements, hip replacements, something that's more common in the population. We think that could be due to part of the reason, but there has been a push now to have more research done specifically to foot and ankle due to that lack of research that we've found. Uh, 
Um, so your inclusion criteria range from 10 to 95. Do you perceive that there will be any problems with that range such that like younger patients might not have readmissions as much as the older patients? Right, so that is something that we've considered. Our population right now is predominantly adults, so over 18. There may be an incidental inclusion of those younger than 18, and we've accounted for that as well. We've also looked at whether or not we should um, segment into subgroups and maybe 10 to 18, 18 to 45, 45 to maybe 65, middle-aged, and see if there are specific differences among each one of those groups, because each one of those age groups can have very different effects on whether these factors have an influence. Uh, how similar, how different are the patients at Beaumont compared to the rest of the country? Uh, we're not sure yet. That's part of why we're doing this research. We want to see if there is a specific thing that's going to be different with this population. Um, other studies have shown that age has a big factor, diabetes, um, weight, similar factors that would be expected, especially when you look at surgical procedures, but we're wondering if Beaumont may have another factor that's particular to this population. Any more comment? Yeah. Well, one last question. Um, have you considered, I know you said you're looking at the orthopedic department, mm -hmm. have you considered look at comparing um, podiatrist uh, outcomes with this orthopedic department? Just so right now we haven't, but that's a very good point. We may want to do that in the future and look at specifically those that are podiatrists versus those that are orthopedic surgeons. Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next, our next presenter is Komal Kapoor. Please welcome Komal. Hello everyone, my name is Komal Kapoor and I will be talking about the use of procalcitonin to assist with antibiotic treatment decisions. Antibiotics have been a fantastic discovery, but overuse leads to resistance, and this is a huge concern. As we can see in this image, there were 14,000 deaths due to minimum, uh, due to C. diff, and 23,000 due to bacterial and other fungal infections. As a result, researchers realized that procalcitonin could be used as a serum biomarker to mark bacterial infection. And procalcitonin guided therapy was approved by the FDA for sepsis and lower respiratory tract infection. Procalcitonin guided therapy is also known as the Vieta Brahms procalcitonin test. And basically, as we can see in this image, the greater the procalcitonin, the greater the severity of septic shock, showing that procalcitonin levels correlate with sepsis infection. And this can be equated to low respiratory tract infection as well. Now, Beaumont has approved a strategy to expand the use of procalcitonin guided therapy at our hospital. While previous studies have focused more on the research-related aspects in lab settings for procalcitonin, this is the first one to look at the clinical impact that procalcitonin guided therapy can make at the hospital. So what we're trying to figure out is how will procalcitonin impact the decisions to continue or discontinue antibiotic therapy after this procalcitonin strategy is implemented at Beaumont. And this is an observational study, um, so the researchers will not be taking part in any of the intervention of this guided therapy. So the first set of data we're going to collect is going to be the pre-strategy implementation data. And we're going to collect variables such as procalcitonin, um, antibiotics, and outcomes, just to name a few. A after, this, after this strategy implementation done by the antibiotic stewardship team, we're going to collect these variables again and do some qualitative data analysis to, to see what type of correlations we can find. The current project status, we're awaiting IRB approval and we're trying to get that in within the next few weeks. Um, and the next steps we're planning to take is figuring out dates for when the official strategy implementation will be taking place at Beaumont. Um, 
what we're hoping to see is that procalcitonin-guided therapy will decrease antibiotic use without having an impact on the outcome for patients. Some of the challenges and limitations that we're facing is that this is very dependent on group dynamics. It's dependent on pharmacist and physician collaboration. So we have to work as a team and be flexible, flexible with dates and other um, things that come our way. Secondly, this is a fairly new test. And with all new tests, there's time for learning, there's time, there's a learning curve, and it, it takes time to actually implement it. So we're hoping we have enough pre-strategy data for our analysis. In short, this is a clinical observational study on procalcitonin guided therapy and antibiotic usage. What we're hoping to see is that we can find a correlation between the frequency of procalcitonin administration and a decreased unnecessary antibiotic use. In the future, we're hoping we can do more prospective interventional studies where patients who are taking antibiotics can be, uh, physicians can intervene and administer procalcitonin guided therapy to help with antibiotic decisions. And this can also help to figure out when or how much um, a procalcitonin to give. In short, our main goal is to see that procalcitonin implementation can lead to decreased antibiotic use and therefore decreased antibiotic resistance, leading to decreased deaths throughout the world. So these are my references. And I would like to thank Dr. Carpenter for his mentorship and support, Dr. Baxa and Dr. Sorinsky, and our current co-directors, Dr. Loftus and Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much, and I'll take any questions at this time. Thanks, Kamal. Great work. Thank you. Um, I had a question from your introduction. So why do you think, or has the literature talked about why procalcitonin is correlated with sepsis? I'm just not seeing the link based on what I, would, uh, what I know about procalcitonin. Right. No, that's, that's a really good point. So um, the FDA specifically has approved sepsis and lower respiratory tract infection because what they found in their studies was that the P, like, you know, the significance for that was, had a very low p-value, you know, less than 0.05 or less than 0.01 for some. So the FDA specifically approved those two. There have been some studies that show um, other infections, such as urinary tract infection or uh, meningitis, uh, having this similar trend with procalcitonin, but it, it hasn't been approved because it's not sis uh, significant enough at this point. Future studies, we may have like uh, more studies that show this significant value, but as of right now, there um, isn't. It might be of interest for you to know that the original discovery that thyrocalcitonin, not this synthetic material that we're testing, was first described actually here as elevated in, in about 1980. There was a um, report in the Lancet from Beaumont of patients with toxic shock syndrome because of the severe hypocalcemia that uh, they had a number of tests done, including calcitonin. And it was uh, surprisingly found that they were massive increases. And this was then re dis uh, confirmed by a number of people at the University of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and a number of other places. And then this then became an idea for a possible test to look at uh, correlation with uh, bacterial infections. Thank you for bringing that point up. Um, what does procalcitonin do normally, and how is it normally controlled? So normally it serves as a serum marker, uh, sorry, nor normally it's a precursor for calcitonin. And um, what happens is it's released by our thyroid gland, um, but it's also in terms of infection. It's released in times of stress. And this is particularly in the neuroendocrine cells of um, adipose tissue. So um, yeah, so it serves as, a, it can serve as a biomarker because of that increase with infection. Uh, yeah, one last question. Okay, I'm, I'm really naive in the subject, so thank you for sort of giving me that background. Um, if I'm a patient that is on antibiotics, 
Uh, I also can be very non-compliant with that. I could maybe take them for a day, forget to take them, take them all at once. So how are you just looking at who gets it, not whether or not they're compliant through the entire uh, antibiotic treatment, or if I get uh, the procalcitonin, I'm not quite sure how that's administered, if it's the same oral or if it's... You know, how do you get to control the c compliance of the patient? Yeah, um, so one thing before I answer your yeah. question, I just want to clarify. Um, procalcitonin is um, a, it's kind of like, let's say, thyroid hormone. It's, uh, it's something that you can measure in your blood to figure out, um, you know, what level you have. And using that number, you can figure out what yeah. it is. Um, so in regards to um, uh, compliance, um, we're looking at, we're, we're going to be looking at data or individuals who are going to be at the hospital setting. So like the ICU or the ED. And we're hoping that um, this is something we don't have to worry about because the nurses or the physicians involved in the care of the patient can um, uh, help with the, okay, yes, yes. And then in the future we can hope to do studies that are, you know, more, okay, so you're taking antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can use procalcitonin, um, you know in a non-hospital setting. But right now it's reserved to hospital setting. Thank you, thank you for that. that thank you for that point, <laughs> yes. Sorry. I just want to make one more comment. As a physician who orders this test, that there is a deep bias not to trust it. So when you do your observational uh, review, uh, you'll find that people order the test, but they don't necessarily follow the results because they're still, they're, remember, they're not going to treat patients by a one test. They're looking at the total patient picture. picture. If the patient looks terrible, but the test is n zero, they're not going to say, oh, I guess there's no infection and I'll stop all the antibiotics. Right, right. So this is what people are doing now, and you're going to discover this when you do your review. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, please welcome our next presenter, Julia Kim. Hi, my name is Julia Kim and my project is Quality of Life in Pediatric Patients with Neuromuscular Disorders. I'm working with Dr. Eileen McCormick in Beaumont's Department of Pediatric Neurology. Neuromuscular disorders are chronic neurologic disorders that affect any part of the nerve and muscle with an impact on sensation or movement. They are classified as rare diseases, which, is our, which are diseases affecting fewer than 200,000 people. Unfortunately, more than half of the people affected by rare diseases are children. There are approximately 600 neuromuscular disorders that are genetic and progressive, and although amazing treatments have been discovered to slow the progression of some of the neuromuscular disorders, the majority are still incurable. Listed here are some of the neuromuscular disorders affecting the pediatric population. Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for example, would affect um, a boy's muscles starting at his limbs and progressing inwards. So around the age of two, he might experience weakness in his calves and clumsiness. Around the age of 10, he's going to need a wheelchair to get around. And then when he's in his late 20s, his muscles will no longer be able to support his heart and lungs. Because we have such an abbreviated amount of time with these patients, it's a top priority of the neuromuscular community to optimize their quality of life. As such, I've developed a survey focusing on the physical, social, and psychological aspects of their quality of life. We know that it can be difficult to be a kid today, but can you imagine going through puberty while simultaneously experiencing the decline of all of your muscles and knowing that you might not make it to your 30th birthday? Because of the b emotional and physical burden of these diseases, I hypothesize that pediatric patients with neuromuscular disorders experience a decreased quality of life. Quality of life studies abound. There are studies for kids, there are studies for people with neuromuscular disorders, but we're lacking studies for kids with neuromuscular disorders. So I've developed a study for 7 to 17 year olds and obviously 7 year olds and 17 year olds don't share the same quality of life factors so I've split them into a younger and an older group. My study focuses on three domains, 
The physical questions ask things like, are you able to feed yourself with a spoon or fork? Or, do you need help turning over in bed at night? A social question could be, do your friends understand your medical condition? Or, do you feel like you can find a girlfriend or boyfriend if you want one? And a psychological question might be, how often do you feel good about your body? There's a free response block at the end for patients to write how their neuromuscular care team can better support them. The idea was for me to give out these surveys in the clinic when the patients come in to see the pediatric neurologist. However, it was difficult for me to be in the clinic, so as a result, our sample size is very small. To correct this, we're developing an electronic version of the survey that I'll email to the parents, and then to provide consent, the parents will forward to their kids. Um, this population especially is very attached to their electronics because it's an aspect of their life that they have control over. So um, we imagine that the electronic surveys will be well received. We're also increasing our age range from 7 to 25 in order to access more of the patients who are visiting the neuromuscular clinic. Right now we're waiting on the IRB amendment approval for the electronic surveys. When that's approved, we'll administer the surveys and attempt to wrap up data collection in October. The goal right now is to identify trends in the patient population in quality of life. However, in the long term, I'd like for these studies, for the surveys to be tools for the pediatric neurologists to create tangible responses to their patients' needs in the clinic. So for example, if a patient is indicating tiredness every day, the neurologist can refer to a sleep study. Or perhaps the pediatric neurologist can get involved in a bullying situ situation at school that, might, that the patient might have been too timid to bring up otherwise. Perhaps a patient who is struggling to deal with the psychological burden of their disease can be referred to counseling right away. If these patients are monitored over time with these surveys, perhaps a pediatric neurologist can notice changes and address them as they come up. The ultimate goal of this project is to improve the quality of life in this pop patient population until a cure for each and every muscular dystrophy has been discovered. Thank you. Comments, questions? Thanks, Julia. Well done. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, when you were uh, introducing us to your um, research questions before you went to methods, you mm -hmm. wanted to determine um, how much the quality of life was decreased. So to me, that means you would be comparing it against a normal population. So do you, mm -hmm. are you going to be comparing it to a different data set to give you kind of a baseline of what they should be at? Mm -hmm. That would be uh, something that we'd like to do in the long term. So right now it's just a pilot study, so we're comparing within the group, looking at different demographic factors and also diagnosis codes, but in the long term it would be a great idea to compare to children without neuromuscular disorders. Mm -hmm. Uh, are there any experimental or innovative treatments for these kinds of conditions that you know of? There are a lot of really amazing treatments. There are um, injections for people with spinal muscular atrophy that uh, are slowing, slowing the disease and allowing people, allowing these kids to regain control of some, some parts of their bodies, which is really cool. There are medications that the pa patients are taking. And also, this population is very susceptible to experimental treatments because the, pa the parents and the patients are so eager to try to get some ability back. Uh, any more comments or questions? Yeah, okay. Thanks, Julia. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you're comfortable sharing, what got you interested in this topic? Did you have some personal connection to it, or is it an, an, an area that you're interested in pursuing um, for a specialty in the future? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very passionate about muscular dystrophy, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, I've worked with these kids for five summers um, in the summer camps in three different states, and I care a lot about them. <laughs> Thank you. Take your seats, please. Take your seats. Okay, we'll start off. We're making good time. Our next presenter is Nick Condolion. Please welcome Nick. <laughs> All right, so can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? All right. All right, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nicholas Condolion. 
and today we're going to be talking about Parkinson's disease. More specifically, do inhaled anesthetics accelerate the progression of Parkinson's disease? So a little background, Parkinson's disease is a chronic and progressive movement disorder characterized by dopaminergic neuron loss within the substantia nigra area of the brain. Uh, the causes of the disease are still not really well understood, but it's thought to be both genetics as well as environmental factors that contribute to the pathophysiology. It's also thought that those predisposed to Parkinson's disease that are exposed to perioperative elements, such as pain, inflammation, surgery, and anesthetics, may be at an increased risk for acceleration of their disease. So we hypothesized that if individuals predisposed to Parkinson's disease are exposed to inhaled anesthetics alone, they will have an increased acceleration of Parkinson's disease-like pathology and symptoms. So in order to test this, we used an animal model, specifically the DJ1 rat model. And we split them into two groups, an acute group and a non-acute group. And within these groups, they were further divided into exposed, meaning they were given 1.5% isofluorine as their treatment, and control, meaning they were given 30% oxygen within nitrogen as their treatment. So at two months, the rats arrived at the facility, and they were randomized into their specific groups. At six months, the exposures began, and exposures took place over the course of six weeks to their respective treatment. Now, during that six-week period, the acute group underwent behavioral testing uh, to assess motor function. And at eight months, the acute group was euthanized, and their brains were harvested for later analysis. Now, following that eight-month period, the non-acute group began behavioral testing and or continued behavioral testing in order to assess the longitudinal effects of the anesthetics. At 12 months, the non-acute group was euthanized and their brains were harvested. So following that 12-month period, immunohistochemistry was done with two assays. The first one was an anti-IBA1 assay, which measured the amount of activated microglial cells. And the second one was an anti-tyrosine hydroxylase assay, which measured the amount of dopaminergic neurons. So for the first behavioral test, the latter rung test, a higher score correlated to worse motor activity. So within the acute group, on average, the exposed animals had worse motor activity compared to the control, but it didn't rise to a significant value. Now within the non-acute group, the control animals had worse motor activity compared to the exposed that did rise to significance. For the second behavioral test, the Rotorot test, uh, now a lower score correlated to worse motor activity. So on average, the exposed animals had worse motor activity than the control within the acute group, and there was no difference in the non-acute group. Now for the immunohistochemistry, remember IBA1 was for microglial cells. On average, within the acute group, the exposed animals had higher concentrations of activated microglial cells, where there was no difference within the non-acute group. And then for tyrosine hydroxylase, remember for dopaminergic neurons, there was a significant decrease in dopaminergic uh, neuronal concentration within the exposed group compared to the control when looking at the acute animals. And then there was no difference in the non-acute. So when looking at the acute group, there was a trend of data showing that on average, the exposed animals, meaning exposed to 1.5% isofluorine, uh, performed worse at the motor tests. And these findings rose to pathological findings in the brain when analyzing with immunohistochemistry. And there was no difference when looking at the non-acute group. So this was interesting to us and led us to believe that the subtle neuropathological stress from the inhaled anesthetics may have activated pathways that compensated for the acute injury over a longer period of time. So we concluded from these preliminary results that inhaled general anesthetics accelerate the onset of Parkinson's disease like pathology and symptoms, but in a transient manner, meaning it resolves over a longer period of time. So the limitations to this study were that the DJ1 rat model does not develop synucleopathies, which are a hallmark of Parkinson's, as we all know. And we didn't have the genetically matched control animal, the long Evans hooded rat. So in the future, we hope to increase the end for the immunohistochemistry and introduce surgery into the model to assess what the effects it might have. Uh, so thank you to FAIR, Pen Anesthesia, 
uh, Dr. Roderick and Mary Ellen Ekenhoff, who are my mentors, and Dr. Baxa, who's my co-mentor here at the school. Okay. Comments, questions? Um, two parts. So when you're looking at um, in the future for the uh, brain staining, what are you expecting to see based off of these preliminary results with your population of rats? Yeah, so if we introduce surgery into yeah. the model, you would expect to be more inflammation within the brain. And how would you measure that? So we would use the, uh, the same assay, the IVA1, mm -hmm. to measure activated microglial cells, which is the macrophage of the brain. And you're so, going to count these and look at these and stain? Okay. Yep. So we would use the same staining, and okay. specifically we looked at the hippocampus. Um, How would you describe the location of the hippocampus, like in a coronal section? So that in you a could coronal find section, <laughs> we... Yeah, I mean, we, we isolated the CA1 region of the hippocampus, okay. and we specifically kind of isolated one small area and counted the cells within that area. So it was more of a concentration within the CA1 region opposed to the whole hippocampus itself. Okay, so you're taking a section of the hippocampus yes. that has been predetermined from the literature to right. sort of hone in all of your counting skills. Cause right. I've counted before, so uh, yeah. yeah, have fun with that. No, it's um, tedious. It's tedious. So uh, just another question. We, you talked about predisposing uh, one of the populations to Parkinson's. How would you define that in the human population? Obviously, we're not being injected with isofluorine, so right. what would predispose us? Again, I know you had one slide uh, that you touched on. Right. Uh, so like I said before, the cause of Parkinson's disease yeah, is still not really well yeah. understood but it's thought to be genetics as well as environmental factors. Mm -hmm. So we talk about predispos predisposition as a genetic factor. Okay, so, so the rats right that now. we used were a Park 7 knockout, yeah. meaning they were predisposed to Parkinson's disease. Right. So we thought, okay, do you have a family history and are you okay. predisposed to maybe developing Parkinson's disease? So family history right. is pretty much what, all right, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any more comments, questions? Um, I'm just curious about when you guys are looking at this research, when, if you can just help distinguish, I was a little bit confused about like the Parkinson's disease symptoms and Parkinson's disease, like how you were distinguishing those out. Like I understand what the symptoms are, but it didn't make sense to me exactly like why there was kind of both groupings there. Does that sure. make sense? Yeah, within the, like the acute group and the non-acute group? Yeah, like I just, I mean it just, if you're just looking at transient, you, you said at the end it was transient symptoms. I'm wondering mm -hmm. why that's important. Like I get why Parkinson's disease would be important, but like Parkinson's like symptoms that are transient, I just don't understand quite the importance of sure, that. Sure, sure. Yeah, so what actually preceded this whole study was a case report. And a man came in for a routine cholecystectomy. And when he emerged from surgery, actually had full-blown symptoms of Parkinson's disease where he was rigid, he had like no facial expression, um, wasn't able to respond to commands, and those resolved within 30 minutes. So he was back to normal within 30 minutes, but within a year and a half, he had come back in with a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. So we were looking at within the acute group and the non-acute group, was there a transient effect from the exposure of the anesthetic alone? So we did behavioral testing for the acute group up to that eight month period. And then we continued doing behavioral testing for the non-acute group up to the, tw up to the 12 months. So. All right, thank you. Uh, our next presenter is Martin Randall. Please welcome Martin. Hi everyone, my name is Marty Randall and uh, with my mentor, Dr. Bernard Degnan, our project is a study evaluating blood glucose trends at a youth diabetes camp. 
So a little, about, a little bit about this camp you're going to hear all about. It's called Camp Medicha. It's organized by the American Diabetes Association, or the ADA, and it's located in Fenton, Michigan. It's for kids with type 1 diabetes aged 8 to 17. Something that's really important to mention about camp is that we have very, very close monitoring of their blood sugar or blood glucose while they're there because they have different diets than they're used to at home and different levels of exercise. Usually they're exercising a lot more while they're at camp. And the great thing about camp that's worth mentioning is that it's a great opportunity for kids with a chronic disease like diabetes to get a very traditional childhood camp experience in a medically structured environment. So our study in particular there's been an observation in previous years that certain groups of campers were coming to dinner with a little bit higher blood sugar than others. So the thought was that these campers are missing some insulin at some point in the afternoon. If you take a look at this sample schedule here, you may notice that every group of campers, every single day, goes swimming at some point between lunch and dinner. And we think this is why this phenomenon is happening. But why does it even matter? So hyperglycemia or high blood sugar is something that we strive very hard to avoid. For one, you can reach the potentially life-threatening complications like diabetic ketoacidosis. But also, part of camp is that we're teach trying to teach these kids good life skills for managing their diabetes to prevent some of these long-term complications like eye disease, heart disease, kidney disease, all those things. So the way we did our study is a retrospective review of the camp's internal medical records. We took all of the campers who participated in a one-week session at Medicha in 2017. There were two of those sessions. We broke them up into two groups, the campers who are getting their insulin while they're swimming and the campers who are missing their insulin while they're swimming. The campers who are getting their insulin are using injectable insulin, so they get a dose of long-acting insulin in the morning that's working all day, or they're using a certain kind of pump called the Omnipod, which stays attached to them when they go in the water. The campers missing their insulin are using every other brand of pump except the Omnipod. And these pumps are not water friendly and they're very expensive and parents don't like when they end up in the bottom of the lake. So they come off before they even go on the beach. The current status is that all the data has been collected. We just completed our first round of analysis. And the next step is to bring these results this summer to the camp directors to kind of see what we found. Well, what did we find, you may ask? Um, our main endpoint was the change in blood glucose from lunch to dinner. So what we did is we took those two groups we just talked about, we performed a multivariate linear regression between the difference um, from lunch to dinner, and it was an adjusted calculation, meaning we took into account the camper's age, height, weight, gender, most recent hemoglobin A1C, the number of carbs they ate at lunch, the amount of insulin they got at lunch. The p-value for the difference was 0 0.0318, so it was a statistically significant difference. If you take a look at this graph here, the left side is the lunch blood glucose, the right side is the dinner. The blue line are those campers who are getting their insulin in the afternoon. The gold line is the campers who are missing it. So as you can see, there is a statistically significantly smaller increase from lunch dinner for those campers who are getting their insulin. But you have to look a little bit closer. This shows the confidence intervals for the difference on each single day of camp over those two weeks. And only two groups, are only, sorry, only two days actually had statistical significance. Although the difference or the trend was seen every day, the magnitude varied and we think this may be due to different menus on the day or different levels of exercise and this is something we want to try and go back and correlate as we move forward with this study. Some of the challenges we had is that we wanted to collect 2016's data but the ADA decided to ship it off to their headquarters so we don't have access to it anymore. So we may want to collect 2018's data to try and see if this trend is continuing from year to year. And then the records are hand collected by each individual medical staff, so there may be differences in the way things are collected. That may be a challenge as well. And then what happens at Medicha may not necessarily happen at the ADA camp in California or Texas or Wisconsin, so we may not be able to translate our results to other ADA camps. So to wrap up, the big overarching theme here is that how do we best manage our campers' blood sugar while they're at camp? They're placed under our care. We want to make sure that they're being safe and also that we're teaching them good skills for managing their diabetes. Is there anything that we can change at camp is a question that we have that would prevent this one group from having this higher blood sugar at dinner. And of course we need to talk about the difference between statistical and clinical significance because of course while our data showed there is statistical significance, looking at it the difference is only about 14 points of blood sugar. So something we want to talk about with the camp medical directors is do you think this is significant enough that we need to change camp protocols? Um, references. And a very big shout out to all these people. Thank you so much for your help. And thank you for your attention. Comments, questions? <laughs> um, so just 
a, a couple little short questions. Sure. One, um, we, you mentioned menu and schedule. Sure. Is that something set by the ADA, or do you have autonomy at this camp to come up with whatever meals you want? Yeah, it's, it depends on the camp. The camp okay. is actually, the base camp is actually a YMCA camp sure. that the ADA just borrows for a couple of weeks. So they kind of set that schedule. Do you have access to the other camps that the ADA runs to look at their schedule and their meals? I'm sure we could get it. I mean, I haven't looked yet, but of course, you know, that could be something we look at in the future. Okay, because, I mean, yeah, the 14 points is something, as a diabetic, you know, I'm looking at it like, you know, that right. my change happens all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think what you want to look at is that the schedule um, because yes if given insulin you will see a difference I mean yes so yeah I was just curious if there's something that the ADA regulated or if there was a way to actually look at other camps to get their menu to see again if they're having a yeah. similar situation where they just don't have a break in their awesome schedule to go ahead and give themselves that insulin dose yeah of course okay. that's something we might want to look into in the future that's a very good point though thank okay. you great presentation and thank congrats you. on having your data uh, collected thank already you. Um, so, in very, very simple <laughs> terms, for us people who aren't overly sophisticated with statistics, what sure. is a multivariate linear regression in simple hmm. terms? What does it do? That's a great question. Okay. <laughs> I, I wasn't prepared for this question. <laughs> <laughs> I, unfortunately, I, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, I, I defer to our very helpful statistical department when they, when they do that with us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about these pumps, what, how they work and where they're worn and things like that? Yeah, of course. So um, with the pumps, and of course there's a difference between the two pumps, that's why one pump is in the different group. Uh, you can think of the pumps as having kind of two different components. There's the part that's delivering the insulin, and there's the part that's kind of the settings, and you telling the pump, give this much insulin, I'm eating this many carbs. So most pumps, the ones that come off before they go in the water, it's all contained in one part. So you have this little pump, it might be you know, smaller than the size of a deck of cards, and it has the insulin reservoir that holds the insulin connected to a thin cannula that goes to the skin. And it also has a little screen with where you can put in the settings and say, I'm going to eat this many carbs, so I need to take this much insulin. The Omnipod pump is a little bit different because it has the pod component, which is just the reservoir and a cannula, and that just sits on them all the time. And in it's connected to something that they call a personal diabetes manager, or PDM. So it's this little handheld device that is where you input the settings, and that communicates with the pod and tells it to give this much insulin. So those are the differences between the two kinds. Any last questions or comments? Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please welcome our next presenter, David Weinfield. Hi, I'm David Weinfeld, and my project is examining color vision deficient medical students' performance and attitudes in histology. So histology is the microscopic study of cells and tissues visualized often by colorful staining. And it's important because every medical school in the country requires it, it's on boards, and it helps students understand basic medical foundations. Color vision deficiency, colloquially known as color blindness, uh, is the inability to distinguish different shades of color. And there are several different types of this. It's an excellent recessive trait that shows up in 8% of men and 0.5% of women. So in an evenly distributed room, about five people will be colorblind. Um, uh, in 100, I'm sorry. So this is what the average student sees when they do histology, and this is something that a colorblind student might see for that same image. So as we move forward, I want you to think about how can you know what others in the room can see that you cannot? And if you became aware of this problem, how would you verbalize that to your professors? The current literature is basically non-existent. Um, there's grayscale images that have been shown to potentially help, as shown in figure one, where the blue and the purple or pink is all better seen with the gray. <laughs> but in figure two, it actually becomes more detrimental in the blood smear. Uh, there was a nice study done in the UK with color hue saturation, and that was preferred by color vision deficient students, but there was no follow-up on that, and it's not been used anywhere. Uh, very few studies have quantified any disadvantage, um, and many individuals are unaware of the extent or even the existence of their color blindness, so self-reporting measures are limited. Uh, no one's asked, are color vision deficient students at a disadvantage, and if they are, do they know it? 
So our objectives are to determine if color vision deficiency, uh, deficiencies impo uh, impact performance on assessments, and if it does, do the students feel they're at a disadvantage, and if they do, do they seek help? Our hypothesis, that the colorblind students will have lower scores, um, and that they will not be aware of their disadvantage, and thus will not seek help. Our data collection was done here at OUWB with an N of 250. We sent it out to M1s and M2s. Uh, the demographic questions ask school, year, and gender at birth. Then there's a validated colorblindness test that also determines type of colorblindness. Uh, then we had a unique system that we can't unfortunately get into because of time that had 26 uh, extended multiple choice questions and 26 standards, followed by a Likert scale that assessed performance and attitudes in histology. So our data analysis is mainly splitting the groups into two groups, color vision deficient and normal color vision students and assessing their performance and assessment. Um, other groups that we can look at, as you'll see later, are different medical schools and M1s versus M2s. Our data analysis is really relying on that multiple choice component. Uh, in that, we're looking at how students do on the extended multiple choice, the standard multiple choice, and also the time they spent on that question, which is secretly recorded. Uh, questionnaire uh, then assesses the performance, and we have perceived difficulty in histology, the hours seeking help, and perceived disadvantage. Our anticipated results. Uh, students will have, uh, colorblind students will have lower scores, and they're going to take longer on their assessments. All groups will find the class difficult, and thus the students will not seek help. Um, color, <laughs> colorblind students will also be unaware of their uh, disadvantage based on everyone finding it difficult. It's a catch-22, and uh, the students are unaware of their uh, disadvantage, or they're unaware of their deficiency, and thus they don't seek help. Therefore, their educators are unaware of that, and they don't seek out students that would be unaware of this in the future. It's a self-serving problem that nobody's addressing. Some challenges and solutions. Students aren't lab rats, so we can't really control where they take their survey or how they do it, how much they study. But that's actually reflective of real life and real students, so we actually think that works to our advantage. The biggest problem is that it's very hard to find colorblind students within a population. There's enough where this is impacting hundreds of medical students across the country, but it's very hard to find one within one group. So we're actually, as I'll talk about in the next slide, looking at just some collaboration efforts with other medical schools. So the timeline, we distributed this out to uh, M1s in September, and then we did M2s uh, in March of this past year, uh, or this year, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to use the results to see how the questions are doing, which ones are maybe the most efficacious for studying things. We're going to tweak it, work with some collaborations, potentially with the University of Michigan and Central Michigan, as well as some other schools. Um, and then we're going to send it out to uh, the incoming M1s at those schools as they finish their basic tissue histology learning this coming fall. Um, I want to thank Dr. Wiedermeyer uh, for help with the IRB and the virtual microscopy database, which allowed us to use our, their images. Without, this, uh, without them, it wouldn't be possible. Thank you to Dr. Tardy for dealing with me so often. And those are my references, and I'm happy to take any questions. I was just wondering if the students that test um, deficient on the survey, do you tell them that? Yeah, so we work with Dr. Grenadier, who's an ophthalmologist here, um, in case they have any questions. Um, the wonderful thing about color vision deficiency is it really has very little impact on someone's life until you get to a class where uh, color is a major component. Um, we just want to help students identify this problem because there could be some potential limitations both in learning and in practice. Things that could potentially be overcome, but things that need to become uh, part of the consciousness of medical education. So we do tell them and we give them resources if they have any questions. Um, can you describe a little bit about why you chose to do standard versus extended multiple choice and why you think that's important? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of studies that um, basically have recommendations about preference, but nobody's tried to quantify if there's the problem. So actually there was a uh, very important uh, piece of literature put out a couple years ago by the, uh, I believe the journal was the Post-Secondary Education and Disabilities Journal with a list of recommendations which included more time and the options of grayscale. However, no one's ever looked at that. So what we did with those questions, I'm sorry, I don't even have an image for that, but the standard questions are four multiple choice questions. There are studies that date back to the 80s, just in general medical literature, that essentially say that 
highly educated people can actually outperform multiple choice questions. They expect answers, and there's also just when you study for histology, you know certain things that might be asked. Um, the first extended multiple choice uses the same image as the later one. So it's a 10 answer thing. So for example, if we have a picture of an azinophil and a lamina propria, there's, a, there's an arrow pointing to that, and we ask, what is this cell? Now anyone with normal color vision will see it's pink and will hopefully be able to identify it's an azinophil, though if you don't see pink well, that might be very difficult. So we gave 10 options, so there's really no guessing. Uh, the next question then shows that same image, and it can ask something like, what does this cell do? And one of the answers is, it fights parasites and is involved in allergy. Uh, we believe that the colorblind medical students are currently not being identified because they're able to use those context clues and they're doing better on those questions than expected. Uh, if I remember rightly, there are different kinds of colorblindness. Can yes. You talk, uh, tell us a bit about those. Absolutely. So there are three <laughs> major times. There's tritinopes, who actually, according to the literature done by a guy named Spalding in the 1990s in Britain, he doesn't think they have any disadvantage. They have almost no color vision. Uh, Deutneropes is uh, your classic red-green color blindness. And uh, those people are the most common type. And then protonopes are mainly red cones. That's actually what I have. Um, and it is proposed uh, by this guy, Spalding, whose research has not been followed up, and he did it with histopathologists, um, that protonopes would be the ones that have most trouble, as they see red as dark. And they may, for example, if their father asks them, what color do you think your eyes are, they might choose a pink jelly bean. <laughs> for example. <laughs> OK, thank you. Please, wel please welcome our next presenter, Justin Yuan. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for that introduction, Dr. Loftus. My name is Justin Yuan, and today I have the distinct privilege of speaking to you on stereotactic radiosurgery as a component of treatment for brain metastases in small cell lung cancer patients. But before I do that, I'd like to begin with a quick personal story that I hope will highlight to you why this research project means so much to me. So eight years ago, I was diagnosed with a pituitary adenoma, actually right here in Beaumont, in that building where I collected data for Embark. Turns out it's a prolactinoma, which means it's easily treated by medication. Okay, but the initial reaction was to perform neurosurgery on me. Fortunately, my endocrinologist recognized that drug therapy would work instead, which spared me the risks of a brain surgery. Today, everything's great, I'm practically cured. But I mentioned this story to illustrate to you why I think it is so important for us as physicians to be able to recognize different treatment options that might help potentially better our patient's quality of life, which leads me to my research project on small cell. Now, let me be clear, this is a brain project, okay, not a lung project. So small cell accounts for roughly 13 to 18% of all lung cancers. It's the most aggressive one, and it commonly metastasizes to the brain. In fact, it's rarely regarded as a solo entity. Brain mets are actually present in up to one-fifth of all patients at the time of their primary diagnosis. Fortunately, brain mets are highly radiosensitive. So we have three main treatment options. Number one, we can prophylactically irradiate the brain if there are no mets at the time of the primary diagnosis. Okay, this is a way to control subclinical disease. Second, if the mets are present at primary diagnosis, we can do whole brain radiation therapy. It's the current standard of care. However, there are several drawbacks to irradiating the whole brain, such as the fact that the human brain can only receive so much lifetime dosage of radiation, as well as significant treatment toxicity, such as nausea, vomiting, fatigue, hair loss, dermatitis, and neurocognitive decline. Enter option three, cobalt-60 stereotactic radiosurgery, which from here on I'm just going to refer to as SRS, commonly known as gamma knife. Now, cobalt-60 stereotactic radiosurgery, it's been explored as a complementary treatment to help better neurological control uh, in addition to whole brain radiation therapy. It sports less side effects as well as better local control. If you've never seen the Gamma Knife machines at Beaumont, I'm hoping these next few slides can help illustrate to you the beauty of their mechanisms. So first we have a patient lying on a bed with their head affixed to a metal frame. 201 cobalt-60 isotopes emit high energy gamma rays. The machine is able to self-configure itself around the patient, and this is particularly useful if you have multiple brain lesions, as seen with metastases. 
Each individual gamma radiation path through the brain does not pose a significant radiation damage to healthy brain tissue. But where they converge, you can accurately deliver a self-contained, concentrated dose of radiation. Brainy meets my project goal, which is threefold. We hope to better understand the role that SRS plays in the management of SCLC, which is small cell and cancer brain mets. Two, we hope to measure the efficacy of disease control. And three, we want to quantify the overall survival in our patients. It's a retrospective cohort study, and I use the databases EPIC and Mosaic. Uh, we identified 44 eligible patients at Beaumont who received SRS from the years 2001 to 17, and I used SPSS statistics software package to run a Kaplan-Meier survival analysis with the two main parameters we looked at being neurologic progression-free survival and overall survival. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all these numbers to you, but one result I do want to point you to is the gender distribution. So we know that males smoke on average more than females, and that smoking is tightly associated with the development of small cell lung cancer, thus explaining why we had more male patients than female patients. This is our Kaplan-Meier survival curve showing overall survival. It showed us that our median overall survival for all patients treated with SRS was 7.6 months. And to give you a reference point, for the median overall survival for those treated with whole brain radiation therapy only is 9 months. And the median overall survival for those of non-small cell cancer histologies ranges from 4.3 to 7.8 months. So the similarity of these values suggested to us that SRS does effectively treat small cell brain mets when compared to standard of care as well as non-small cell histologies. In some cases, it may even replace whole brain for, for those patients where whole brain might not be appropriate. So it's our hope that these initial results will help guide physicians to provide care along with their patients that is patient-centered as well as what what the patient would think is best for them. We want this to be a team decision. Of course, there are some limitations, such as our small sample size limiting the power of our study, uh, as well as the fact that most patients did receive whole brain first. Uh, that is the standard of care. So a worthwhile future study is exploring the prospective cohort study using SRS as the upfront treatment, as well as studies evaluating prognostic factors that can help predict, predict local control. While unfortunately most of our patients did eventually pass away, it's my hope that the results of this project can help shed light on SRS as a viable option to help control disease that is pa uh, and be patient-centered care. Uh, these are my references. If you ever want to read them, I can send you a copy of my slides. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Inga Grills, Dr. Zaid Siddiqui for mentoring me, and the Radiation Oncology Department for hosting me. I'm welcome to your questions at this point. Thank you for your time. Comments, questions? I think you mentioned that you were looking at two outcomes, and you only mentioned one, which was the um, was it overall survival, mm -hmm, and yep. what was the other one that you looked at? Okay, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, I didn't have time to get to that one, thanks for asking. It was neurologic progression-free survival, and let me just define that real quickly. Actually, I have an appendix because I only had five minutes. But um, neurologic progression-free survival is the date of SRS to the date of their first failure or death. And so some additional results that I didn't get time to show you actually um, demonstrates the neurologic progression-free survival. Um, I actually also stratified it based on upfront intervention. Um, so some patients received whole brain first, m most patients. Some received that prophylactic cranial irradiation. And we stratified it to see if there's a difference based on that. Um, so of note, Overall, uh, the, the time to develop that first new lesion or their date of death was 3.7 months for all patients. But when you stratify it and you look at SRS as the upfront, it jumps up to 9.2 months. So that's great news. The only drawback, though, is that we only had five patients that were treated with SRS upfront. So can we fully rely on these results? Not totally, but it, it, it does show promise. Yeah. So if I'm not living close to Beaumont, where am I in the country going to track down a facility with an SRS if I happen to be someone with small cell? Yeah, actually, I, I looked this up, too. So a gamma knife machine runs you anywhere from 3 to $4 million. And they, they have their website showing you where you can find certain locations. It's true, Beaumont does sport a gamma knife machine, and we are very fortunate for that. Um, it is not every hospital, so my recommendation would be to look online to see where these machines could be. And if you could afford it, then to get yourself to that hospital. Unfortunately, there would be that disparity, such as patients who can't get themselves to gamma knife machines. And, and that is an unfortunate reality. Thanks, Justin. Great presentation. And again, uh, congrats on having your data collected at this stage.
Um, I have a question about the cancer itself. So where does the small cell lung cancer actually originate and do they know why it prefers to spread to the brain? Okay, so small cell, it's commonly associated with smoking. So, and, and as we all know from step studying, it's in the central part of the lungs. Um, so as you, as you take in the smoke, you're, you're exposing your, your lung cells to this, this uh, carcinogen. And I'm not sure if they know like the exact origin. I'm, I'm sure whoever studies small cell really well knows it. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a carcinoma, meaning that it spreads lymph lymphatically to the brain. And um, it's highly aggressive. Uh, my, my hypothesis is because it's neuroendocrine. So those cells uh, originate from cells that can spread very easily throughout the body. Um, it probably goes to areas like the gray-white junction, um, which is where where metastases like to go in the brain, and because there's multiple of them, you, you get seeding all over the brain, which is why one of the main drawbacks, actually I didn't mention, of SRS is the fact that there is high distant failure. That is to say, other metastases might pop up after you locally treat these. Those scientists and doctors do hypothesize, maybe that's just because your, your lung disease is spreading systemically. Okay, maybe it's not that there were these sub, uh, subclinical disease. Just because our MRI machines are getting better and better, they can find each subclinical lesion. So maybe it's that your SRS didn't do a good job, and maybe it's just that because your lung cancer is progressing to a point where you can't control it fully. Uh, did that answer your question? I totally went on a tangent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, one last question. Really quick. How long are you in the machine? Okay. So I shadowed this once, and uh, we got there roughly at like. 4.30 a.m., 5 a.m., the patient was in there, and by the time I left around 12, they were still in there. So, but, but here's, here's the good news, here's the good news. Whole brain radiation therapy, uh, which is the current standard of care, that requires you to come back to the hospital multiple times. It's done in cycles. Um, so even though you give a higher graze, each individual time you come, it's low. But for the SRS, it's a one-time thing. You come once in the morning, you get numbed up, get that frame put on your head, and you're done with it. It's at a higher concentration, but it's just one dose. You can go home usually by the end of the night. Thank you. Um, we've reached the end of the presentations. We're ahead of time. Okay, um, before I forget, I want to say a few thank yous. First of all, thank you for our presenters. I think you all did a great job. Well done. Uh, thank you to the judges for all your hard work, and thank you for Dr. Roach for organizing them. Uh, thank you to my co-director, Dr. Tracy Taylor, for organizing me. <laughs> and Julie Strong for organizing the rest of us. <laughs> and Dave, the AV man, uh, he's been invaluable as always. Uh, as I said before, we don't make you do these presentations to make life hard for you. You're about to go into your clinical years, you're doing lots and, doing lots, and lots of oral presentations to clinical teams. So your presentation skills are things you must develop if you're going to be a successful physician. So that's why we do it. Uh, now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, our guest speaker is, Dr. is Professor John Krauss from the School of Health Sciences at OU. He's a physical therapist. He's in clinical practice. He's also an academic. He's a great teacher, and he's won awards for teaching. And when I've heard him speak, he speaks with great passion about whatever he's talking about. But he's here today to talk about the relationship between research and clinical practice. So please welcome Professor John Krauss. Thank you very much. And before we start, I'd, I'd like to say, wow, nice presentations, guys. Excellent research, very interesting. Well coached, well mentored. So very nice. So one more round of applause for our presenters. <laughs> so I'd like to thank the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine for inviting me to speak at such an auspicious event. Engaging in a wide variety of research experiences is an essential component to all doctoring professions and provides crucial in critical inquiry and decision-making skills that translate directly to clinical practice. In my short time with you this morning, I'd like to highlight the parallels between clinical practice and critical inquiry. If I can get everything to work, there we go. So, sorry about the translation. There's a little bit of issues between PowerPoint on Beaumont and PowerPoint on the rest of the world, I think. But <laughs> <coughs> transitions don't really work, uh, other, pop, other computers don't really work, but that's okay. We're going to make it work. So let's loosely compare the similarities between clinical practice and critical inquiry. Both start with a question. 
In research, it's called the research question. In clinical practice, it's usually a question generated by the patient seeking our help. To begin answering the question, we seek some background information. In research, we perform a literature review. In clinical practice, we take a patient history. In some cases, that immediate question is answered from the literature and no further inquiry is necessary. In many cases, however, the question is not sufficiently answered, and so we, be, so we have to design a study that will help us answer the question. Armed with the literature and the patient history, we seek to gather new information that will help us answer the unique question. In research, we design our study, putting together the methods, whereby we will collect relevant data in clinical practice, we perform a physical exam and collect additional relevant diagnostic tests and measures. In both research and clinical practice, we analyze the results, which we then compare with prior literature and population norms. In research, this is presented within the discussion. In clinical practice, this happens behind the scenes as part of the clinician's evaluation process. After the evaluation and due consideration of the current findings contrasted with prior research, we have to come to a conclusion regarding the answer to our initial question and what the next steps in the process will be. In research, we typically summarize our findings and make recommendations for future research. In clinical practice, we form a diagnosis list and determine the next steps for our patient's medical management. So this sounds simple, doesn't it? But it turns out it's not really very simple. So let's look at the various areas that we just talked about. First of all, is the question relevant? Think about it. When you pick up a journal, what papers are you interested in reading? Why are you interested in one over another? Clearly, some questions and papers are more interesting to each of us. This is inherent to our areas of practice, practice experiences, and personal biases. With the rise of online journals, we have access to much more literature than in the past. This is due in part to the access as well as the increasing number of journals. So with an increasing number of journals and increasing and greater access, do we have the necessary supply of, of quality papers and quality researchers? To answer this question, we need to consider the number of academic programs available locally, nationally, and internationally. Within physical therapy and healthcare in general, we see an expansion in the size and number of academic programs and the number of faculty teaching within these programs. The majority of these faculty are expected to publish as part of their academic and professional work. Now all these academics and researchers were mentored by someone. It is very common for these mentees to pursue research along the same research paradigm as their mentors. With increased numbers of researchers, increased numbers of publications, opportunities, similarities in research paradigms, and inexpensive methods of disseminating research, is inevitable that there will be some watering down of the quality of the questions asked within the literature. So when we look at the literature, we have to ask ourselves, is a particular research question clinically relevant? Does it reflect the reality of clinical practice? Research is controlled. Typically, it's very clean. In contrast, clinical practice is messy. There are financial constraints, time constraints, pressure, responsibility, Often the clinician has to make decisions in the presence of uncertainty. Next, let's ask ourselves, what's in the literature? What is the strength of the published work? What are the relevant, what are the levels of evidence? Does the literature directly answer the question or is it just similar to the question? There are many obvious items that are not written about in literature. This is one of those times when I have often give examples to my students. So they're often talking, we talk about, you know, they, they're asked to go and they, they search the literature to answer a question. And they'll come, go out and do clinical experiences and they'll come back and say, you know, we saw this in use and the clinician was saying this is the evidence supporting the use. And some of it is good literature and some of it's just not very good quality. And so I ask them, you know, simple things like, you know, if you fall down on cement, does it hurt? What's the answer to that question? Typically, yes. I said, do you find a paper that's written about that? No. Common sense. What about common sense when you're looking at the literature? So part of this is there are things that we know that inherently we know that we learn if we've been exposed to the world at all, 
that does not get written in the literature, yet we tend to ignore it when we talk about practicality of, of practice. What is published is determined by the journal editors, editorial boards, and reviewers. And remember, journals are written for a public audience. They're selling a product. So we have to remember that publishers, editors, editorial boards, and reviewers have their own personal biases. Now, of course, we try thinking about in an alt altruistic world, we try to get rid of those biases, but in reality, they still exist. And the examples I'll give as we get towards the end of my presentation will highlight how these biases influence the, the uh, practice of medicine and physical therapy. My advice typically for novices and novice researchers is they evaluate the journal's publisher, editors, editorial board, and reviewer base before they go to all the work to submit their manuscripts. In particular, they should look at the publication trends within the journal and any of the opinion pieces written by the journal's staff. This will help you evaluate any pre-existing biases that will prevent your work from being accepted by a particular journal. Finally, when evaluating the premise behind a publication, look at which information is pulled from the prior literature to form the argument for the value of the publication. Many authors cherry pick the literature to make an argument for the value of their work. As a consumer, you need to go back to the original work and really understand the prior literature's value and if any author is misrepresenting the facts. This is the reality of also publishing. You need to create an argument for why a paper is important and why it should be published. Typically, when we go back to the literature, we are searching for things that create the narrative for the need for what we're going to be doing with our methods and with our, the rest of our study. And the compelling, how compelling the introduction is and how well we're able to summarize the discussion is really what determines whether a paper gets published, at least within my discipline. So finally, regarding the literature, it's important to recognize that many of the manuscripts present within the literature took several years to design, develop, implement, and disseminate. It's not uncommon for it to take two or more years for a paper to, be, to go from submission to acceptance to publication. So there's a lot of lag time between what we see in the literature actually reflects what we see in clinical practice. Next, of course, we think about how good is the design. With the design, we think about, you know, obviously the easiest designs are generally the, the weakest designs. The ones that are the easiest to carry out are the weakest designs. So case studies, case reports, case series, quickly done in clinical practice, not typically very generalizable. An idea about stimulating interest, but not really robust enough to really make much of an impact on what, what, what the practice will be within your discipline. More robust designs, however, with more robust control, provide more generalizability, but are typically narrower in their findings. So from a clinical perspective, here's the challenge. If you have really high strength studies within my discipline, Typically, they're very narrow in their, in their application scope. So then it's like looking at the world through a pinhole on a piece of paper. So I tell my students, OK, well, if you're going to use literature as your primary means of making decisions, you're going to need a lot of pinholes in that piece of paper. And it's very difficult to, to gather all that, uh, that type of literature in, in reality. Now the next thing we think about is the accuracy of our results. We have to be aware that the measures we take and the samples we take are prone to error. We try to mitigate these risks through design, but it's impossible to plan for everything. Once we have our results, we have to reconcile our findings with the findings of other authors. Sometimes that's easy, sometimes it's not. And of course, it depends on whether our work agrees with prior work or discovers something new that we can make an argument for in terms of change. Finally, we come to the conclusion and what is the next step. Generally, the next step in research is to expand, refine, or enhance the methods used within the study. Unfortunately, this means that there is often a significant amount of time before research in the literature helps us to arrive at the answer to our original question. Now let's look at clinical practice. How difficult is the question? This, of course, is contextual. Depends on our patients, our patient population, our practice setting, our practice specialty. So some questions are easily answered and some questions are not. How complete and accurate is the history? We think every clinician accepts the, I think everybody accepts the need for the history. But there are many barriers that interfere with getting a complete history. 
These include the patient's mental status, language skills, willingness to participate, their communicate, our communication skills, and our ability to ask the right question at the right time. When we go through the physical exam and diagnostic testing, we know that each of these processes is fallible. Each of these has false positives, false negatives, so each of these has uh, their own risks. When we look at the accuracy of our results, we, you, we like to use words in clinical practice like validity, reliability, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive values, negative predictive values, likelihood ratios. Many of these require mathematical computations. These are not practically performed in a clinical environment, but they are performed in research. So we can use the research to inform us about the value of certain tests and measures, but in clinical practice you will typically not determine those, those items within your own practice setting. Then we think about how good our evaluation or clin clinical decision making skills are. Unfortunately or, def or fortunately, depending on your perspective, these items, all the findings that we have need to be interpreted and a judgment needs to be made regarding the medical diagnosis. And of course, when we make these decisions, we are prone to error. In medicine, the most common errors are cognitive in nature, which include faulty assessment of pretest probability specificity, which overstates or understates the disease likelihood, or failure to consider all relevant possibilities. And of course, we think next, the last part about in clinical practice is we think about what are the risks of misdiagnosis and risk benefits of treatment. And of course, we know that risk of misdiagnosis means that somebody might get the wrong treatment. In some cases, that's a low risk because the treatment's re re relatively innocuous. In some cases, they, get the, they don't get the right treatment, which means it can be life-threatening. So there are risks, and thankfully, where I stand, my risks are lower than your risks because you're going to be practicing medicine as doctors. I'm going to be practicing as a physical therapist. So you're my fallback. So thank you very much for your future contributions. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, this is gonna be really hard to read, but this is going to provide us with a narrative. So I'm gonna talk you through this, all right? Um, looks great on a computer screen when you're at home, not great when you project it on a smaller screen, relatively. So this is looking at, in physical therapy, the timeline for how we manage cro you know, chronic low back pain. It was actually looking at nonspecific low back pain and the process of determining or developing clinical practice guidelines. And so it's a timeline um, because the issues that we were facing as practitioners in PT was nonspecific low back pain, lots and lots of possibilities for the source of the pain we were just basically taking a large group of people and throwing interventions at them and looking to see did the interventions work, didn't the interventions work, why or why not, and of course what were we finding? Poor results. So the first thing we looked at in terms of a, as a, a practice is in, in 1981 we had a clinician come out, his name was Robin McKenzie, those of you who are practicing physicians in the room probably are, uh, and refer to outpatient ortho, you probably are aware of this man's work. He came up with a classification system to try and characterize what type of, what is the source of low back pain. So he was talking mostly about the disc, degrees of de degeneration of the disc. Um, problem with his, his, his uh, paradigm is it wasn't very reliable. So not very useful in clinical practice. What Ellen Hamblin came out with one that basically looked more at neurogenic sources of pain, again, not very reliable. In 1995, we had a group of, of clinicians or, uh, and researchers out of Pitt who came up with the idea of, hey, why do we keep looking at just a, taking this large group of people and throwing an intervention at them? Why don't we see what are the characteristics of the people that respond to the intervention? So we'll reverse it. Great idea. This was called treatment-based classifications. All right, so what we did was we took and said, okay, for nonspecific low back pain, what do we typically do? They came up with seven ideas. This was later on refined in 2000 to uh, basically four uh, characterizations. Manipulation, traction, specific exercise, and uh, 
and more uh, therapeutic exercise that was more like stabilization exercise. So specific exercise was more of McKenzie's work, which was movement-based. Specific exercise was more stabilization-based, and the others were uh, as they sound. So boil it down, four care categories. Then we started trying to use research to see what are the characteristics that people have that make them respond better to these findings. So in 2002, the first uh, clinical-based, uh, we call it the clinical prediction rule, was published based on this system, which was to determine who would respond best to, to lumbar manipulation in the patient population. They came up with uh, five predictor variables. They had to do with acuity of pain, so less than 16-day-old pain. They had to do with pain that didn't go too far down the leg, so it had to do with not having more neurogenic pain, having more referred pain, um, a number of different other character, uh, characterizations. That's 2002. 2004, our national organization then came up with a, a manipulation guideline, which basically told our, our uh, practicing physical therapist how they should incorporate physical uh, manipulation into, into clinical practice. 2005, to, to make this more usable to the, to the, basically the internist and the PM&R doctor, one of the, one of the group that did the original uh, CPR generation, reduced the variables down to two. So they basically said that if you have somebody that comes in that has pain that doesn't go past the knee and who has had pain that's less than 16 days old, the chances are they'll respond positively to, to spinal manipulation. So sounds great, right? Everything's kind of going in a direction. We've got this thrust going. Then in 2007, we had the first rebuttal to the CPR. This happened in Australia. Uh, Australians always are working against the, against the stream. They don't, like what's, they don't like the direction people are going, so they're going the opposite direction. They said, wait a minute, let's do this a little differently. So let's take this, let's take this rule and let's give it to the therapist and let them apply it how they want to. But for the doctors in the, in the emergency rooms, and this is what they did, they took people coming in with the characteristics that came into the emergency rooms with low back pain, they told the doctors you should give them Tylenol. They told the therapist, you should determine what you want to do with them. So the ther they did the clinical prediction rule, and they basically said the people that fit the, the rule, they got Tylenol, but Clofenac is what it's called over there. I, to me, it's all just another name for Tylenol. But, in, uh, but the physical therapist, what was happening was physical therapists were generalizing the rule. So they were saying any manipulation will work. So they did anything they wanted that was a manipulation and guess what? Equal outcomes. So it didn't matter whether you got manipulation when they didn't control it versus when you got Tylenol. So then we had the podcast rebuttal between the original CPR generators and the, the Hancock and Associates. And basically the argument was you got to control what manipulation they do. And the other argument was, but you're not, you're suggesting that you don't have to control it. So it came down to the literature created this movement. The question was, for those of us in research or we're in clinical practice, like, that's insane. Why would you take somebody that comes in with low back pain that's less than 16 days old, that only goes down below the knee, and immediately assume you can manipulate them? That is not a good plan. You know, we were t I was trained under the idea that you use it discriminately. You don't just use it just because you have it. You use it only in certain circumstances because of risk. So. You know, in 2009, a follow-up to that study, they basically said, we need to really do more looking at these CPRs. Now, there's a lot more backstory to this, and there's a lot of, of work that's done to generate the CPRs and to, to validate the CPRs, but ultimately, we're generating a lot of these clinical prediction rules, which are based on the treatment-based classification, but we don't have them validated well enough yet within the literature. So. What are the motivations behind this research? So I talked about all the different things that, that you have to think about in terms of clinical practice. Well, there are altruistic motives, social motives, political motives, legal motives, financial motives, and educational motives. And I'm just going to pick one of them. We're going to start from there. So let's take legal motives. So in physical therapy, every year, 
we were being sued by chiropractors in at least three to four states. Guess what? Lots and lots of financial burden to the physical therapists. And typically they're not, they're not typically private practice owners who have a lot of money. They're typically working like in Beaumont. They get a salary, you know, they get sued. They don't have the financial means to really fight these suits very well. So then there are national organizations getting pulled in and we're trying to help basically support people who say it's within our right to practice. The major argument that the chiropractors use in, against our ability to manipulate had to do with uh, the fact that they said it wasn't within our entry level education. No, oh, not your entry level. You're getting it post professional, so it's not really part of your practice. So then we looked at why aren't you why aren't you teaching at entry level? Why? Because you didn't think it was safe. You didn't think that it you had the, the you have in order for academics to teach something, they have to have the skill in the something. So if it's a high-level skill and you don't have a, an academic that can teach that high-level skill, they're not being taught at entry level. So let's make it a lower-level skill. So we get a simple technique, we create a study that shows it can be effective, and you sell it to the academics. Then the academics will start teaching it, and it becomes part of the accreditation process, so they have to teach it. See how it kind of works around? So this is forensic research. You have to go back and look at, okay, what, is ha what just happened here? Usually we're finding it out on the back end. So now we think about it. There are other reasons to have this, you know, there, clearly we want to have the most effective treatment. And if you can treat somebody with, an, uh, with a 30 second treatment that immediately gives them relief that, that lasts, that seems like it's viable, right? So better outcomes in a short amount of time, that's a good, uh, financial implication, uh, especially, you know, we think about rising health care costs. If a patient can come in one visit, they're better. It's great. Of course, that depends on whether they really will get better or not. So this is us. So here you have this timeline showing how literature influences practice, influences education, the implications, positives, the negatives. Now clearly, in order for this literature to be put forward, it was put forward and it wasn't challenged. It only, the challenge came later. Why? Because we had, we had a goal as a profession to make this happen. Now they won't say that. I can say that because I wasn't part of any of the decision making process. I'm looking at it from the back end saying this seems like it was, you know, a self-engineered process, which came out with a result that has changed the practice and the teaching within physical therapy. So it's a, controversial topic but here's another controversial topic medical literature this right you guys have all seen this you're all aware of this you all know about the implications of overdoses from opioid prescriptions right we know the numbers it's all I'm sure you've talked about it within your education here's your timeline here's here's the timeline behind this right 1804, morphine distilled to opium. 1953, first hypodermic syringe invented, right? The inventor's wife overdoses using the syringe. He thought if you use the syringe, it will make it so you don't need so much, right? So you, you can, if you're smoking it or whatever you're doing with it, you don't need as much now because you got a syringe. Well, of course, it's a lot more concentrated and it gets into the system a lot quicker when you use the syringe. So it didn't really work out so well for him. 1960, Valium becomes the drug industry's first $100 million drug. Who is it marketed to? Housewives who are unhappy staying at home. So you created this whole group of individuals who, had a, who were addicted to Valium, right? In 1980, we had our first ladder of pain treatment developed by the uh, World Health Organization for the treatment of, for dealing with cancer. In 1980, New England Journal publishes a Porter and Jake's letter to the editor. This is the start of all of the problem, right? So we had all this other stuff, right? Now we have in the literature, in a respected journal, somebody saying, of course it's misquoted often, in a paragraph that if you, if you treat patients with acute pain in a hospital setting with narcotics, they typically don't become, only a small portion become addicted. 
very narrow scope of what they claimed. One of many, many papers and letters this, these people wrote, but this one becomes the argument for why we should start using opioids in the prescription uh, in the management of other types of conditions. Because of course what happens, it's like, this, it's like the game where you say something to one person and it goes around the room, it ends up a lot different by the time it gets back to you. This is what happened here. So they started misquoting it and started selling it. So this, this Valium idea, $100 million drug, first one ever, the guy, uh, Arthur Sackler, Sackler, was the man who basically figured out how to market direct. So you got all these crazy ads on TV now. He started it all back when he was getting Valium to be a $100 million drug. At that time, it was, that was really a big thing. And what did he do? He bought Purdue Pharmaceutical, or whatever it was called before that, and distilled it into that. And guess what they came up with? MS Cotton, OxyContin, all right? MS Cotton was for ca cancer patients. Oxycontin, uh, we'll do this, we'll use this for chronic pain patients. Now, the doors are open. In 1996, president of the Pain Society urges doctors to treat pain as a vital sign. 1996, Dr. David Proctor starts the first pill mill in South Shore, Kentucky. In 1998, he has a car accident, which prevents him from, from, from basically being able to practice medicine, but he hires other doctors who will practice for him, teaches them the business of how to create a pill mill, and then they go out and create new places where they start basically selling the medication and giving lots and lots of prescriptions, which creates this more and more of this problem. In 1998 and 99, the VA and JCO adopt pain as the fifth vital sign. Ten years later, drug overdoses, mostly from opiates, surpass auto fatalities and, lead, and become the leading cause of accidental death in the U.S. Right? So take a piece of literature, misquote it, spin it, create a change with such a tremendous impact. This is, again, where we have to go back to the source and say, wait a minute, did he, were they talking about that at all? We're talking about acute patients. It's totally different than a chronic pain patient. So you say, okay, yeah, 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 we know about this. We don't make these mistakes now. We understand. We've been burned, right? Same with PT. It's like, okay, we, we now are more, we're being more critical about what we're saying. Now let's take this patient here, my final example. So I did a consultation for one of my uh, colleagues. They had a patient basically who turns out was a colleague of mine at the university who's having a lot of neck pain. Uh, and you can see why. Lots of, of spondylosis there. Multiple levels are involved. Um, you know, he's in his mid-60s. He, he came in with 18 degrees of flexion, 22 degrees of extension, 8 degrees of right side bending, 10 degrees of left side bending, 10, 20 degrees of right rotation, 15 degrees of left rotation. Very, very limited. Can't, hard to drive, hard to work. You know, he's a professional. He stands up in front of a classroom. He's got to be dynamic. He's got to move his head around. He can't move. He's, he's got, it's like he's wearing a cervical collar, you know, a hard cervical collar. So the consultation came about for, for this reason. The doctor who referred the patient to my colleague said, ask this question, are you afraid to move? Why? Because we have all this new literature coming out about the neurophysiology of pain and how fear is a major reason for people not moving, right? He said, no, I'm not afraid to move. I have pain when I move. Okay. He said, well, let me tell you, here's what I think we can do. If physical therapy doesn't work, what we can do is we're, we can anesthetize you and have work with a chiropractor and he can manipulate your neck. Does that sound like a good idea? Ever, ever, really. So what do we know happens when you have a fusion or close to a fusion? Everything around it gets more stress and typically it's what goes next. You know, within 
eight, ten years after fusion, the levels around the fusion start to have problems. They may need a fusion themselves if a person doesn't constrain the way they move. You take that person, you anesthetize him, and you torque on his neck with a rotational manipulation. You had a couple things going on, right? This damage, and of course, you can't ignore the vertebral arteries. And we know if he's got this type of degeneration, he's probably got some flattening of the uncle-vertebral joints. He's got some hypertrophy of the facet joints, all of which enter into the area by the vertebral artery. So this would be a disaster, which, of course, I was frank and told him you should not be anesthetized and have your neck manipulated. Within my evaluation, I simply had him sit in front of me and did some easy contract relax movements with some guided additional guided passive range of motion, increased his rotation 10 degrees in both directions within 20 minutes. There's absolutely no reason he should be manipulated. Now, he will have limited motion. I told him, you're never going to have 90 degrees of rotation, 80 degrees of rotation. It's not practical given your neck. But if you can be comfortable, you know, so now we look at, I look at his numbers. He's at least double the amount that he had when he started. So he is comfortable driving, he is comfortable teaching, and he didn't have to have a risky procedure done. So my parting message to you is you should be critical about what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're reading. Try to understand where it comes from, what it really means. Do some of this forensic research understand the motivations, the movements, what happens behind it. Keep thinking. Use common sense. Like I said, you fall down on cement, it typically doesn't feel good. Why would I think it would? Right? So if I take somebody who has pain when they move, why do I think that making them not feel anything and rotating their neck will make them feel great when they finish? So when they wake up, what's going to happen? He's going to be in a lot worse condition. And so he'll probably have a lot of things that are damaged in the process and then that will end up with more restrictions and more problems. And of course, know your discipline. You guys will specialize. You will be the experts in your practice area. That's what makes you the most valuable part of your team when you're working with more professionals. So my last thing is think about you have to have a team-based interprofessional practice. If my patient had relied only on the doctors idea and the doctor's idea was to look at just the rudimentary literature that says pain is the source of your limitation in movement, we could have had a disaster. But because we had this, this interplay between patient and therapist and doctor, we were able to avoid that type of risk. So I think that's all I have to say. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, any questions, anybody? Uh, you remind me of uh, an article that appeared a few years ago in the British Medical Journal, where they showed that uh, there are no randomized controlled trials to show that a parachute is any good when you jump out of an aeroplane. But uh, I don't think anybody's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> any comments or questions, anybody? Could you tell us a bit more about interprofessional practice, your experience with that? Well, uh, I know that it's been a, something we've been working on with, with the medical school and the physical therapy program and the nursing program at Oakland. Clearly, uh, I believe that it's very important, especially when it comes to us having our very specific practice areas and practice expertise. Uh, so. You know, I know that we've done, the opioid workshop has been something we've done a couple of years in a row, uh, which is why I think everybody knows the opioid uh, image that I showed. Um, but I do think that in terms of medical practice in the hospital setting, obviously there has to be a lot, a lot of interdisciplinary work. In outpatient centers, I think it's necessary. It's just more difficult to, to, um, to practice just because of the separation and th the physical separation. So if you're able to be in close proximity or at least have a, a means for communication. And I think the communication, if it starts now, the communication will last. So I think there's some uh, 
um, modifications that we're doing now within the education that I think will have great impact on the future practice for uh, physicians and therapists and nurses. Thank you. So a message there for all you, everybody moving into the clinical years. Work with your PTs, work with your nurses. Um, they'll be a great help to you if you treat them well. Any comments, questions, last chance? If not, we'll thank our presenter. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank the OU Credit Union for sponsoring this event, and we'll now let you all go. Thank you. <laughs>